Hi, and thanks for joining us for what's new in the next generation of Iowa science standards. My name is Francis Vigent. I'm the CEO here at NOATOM. Uh, we'll be taking a walk through um, not only what makes the new next generation science standards a little different and perhaps in some ways tougher, um, but we'll be taking a look at um, sort of four different dimensions here, uh, the three dimensions of the next generation science standards, but also how the next generation science standards link to ELA Common Core and Math Common Core, and how those next generation science standards are shaping methods for STEM instruction, K through 12, and how the higher order thinking skills that are a part of the, the STEM practices and processes help us, uh, along with the Common Core ELA and Math Connections, to teach across the curriculum. But in particular, when we think of areas like art and what some are calling STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and math, um, ways that these STEM practices integrate with art. Um, just to sort of kick things off, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a uh, teacher uh, first, a high school math teacher, and then went on to spend a number of years as a uh, kindergarten through grade six um, STEM specialist with my own classes where I would teach all of the STEM in our building um, for a number of years. My role here now is as CEO, and I was a co-founder about 10 years ago. And um, no, Adam, if, to kind of frame where we fit in the big picture here, um, we help make the next generation science standards something that is achievable in the classroom in terms of you know, what's needed to implement. And, um, and the discussion goes back a little even further than that. The question really is why STEM? Why does science, technology, engineering, and math matter? If you notice our tagline, focus on what matters. Um, why does STEM matter? Why should 100% of students learn science and engineering? Why should they learn these new standards when only 4% of students, and that's a liberal estimate, um, it's actually closer to 3% of students will go on to pursue a science or engineering degree. And we believe, and I think from a workforce development standpoint, nationally the conversation is at a place where science, technology, engineering, and math is a crucial opportunity to teach children higher order thinking skills. And those skills specifically are the skills to create, evaluate, and analyze scientifically. And what I mean by that is from data, um, being able to carry out investigations, use data, and make really informed uh, creations and analysis and evaluations of what's before them when it comes to problem solving and answering questions. And so in the classroom that plays out as putting students in the role of scientist or engineer. And so when you think about that as a classroom educator, how do I do that? And that requires of course not only the standards but curriculum aligned to the standards, the materials to carry that out and a hands-on fashion, um, if that's what you choose. And then, uh, of course, professional development to map skill sets over and sort of understand where alignment comes from. And uh, so, so that's how we sort of fit in this picture. We are based just north of Boston, uh, so not incredibly far, but uh, a little colder, perhaps, uh, than you all are, weather-wise. So let's take a look at sort of the foundation of these next generation science standards and, and to some degree where they come from. Um, so the next generation science standards have evolved from a process that goes way back to, as far as way back, um, to the early 2000s and sort of emanate from the National Research Council, National Academies of Science and Engineering, and the National Institutes of Health that a number of publications in the early 2000s started coming forward, really looking at workforce readiness uh, in terms of readiness for supporting where job growth was coming from. So job growth coming from science and engineering fields, what level of readiness is there when we look at high school graduates, college graduates, and, and where are their gaps? And so that research took a look and really started to kind of think uh, critically about how we were preparing students what was effective and what wasn't. And what 
the conversation moved to pretty quickly was that K-12 uh, science edu education really focused on teaching children about science and about engineering in terms of what it has accomplished. It was very fact-oriented. Now, in a place like Iowa, you have inquiry standards, and those inquiry standards should be infused throughout all the different content areas. However, um, that's not always the case, and certainly nationally that's not always the case because some states have very fact-oriented standards. Um, but what emerged from all of this was a clear look at what was effective STEM instruction and a clear definition of what science and engineering is. And so let's take a look at that in this kind of innovation cycle or STEM cycle. So the National Academy's definition, which sort of permeates the existing next generation science standards now, is this idea that science answers questions using experiments. So it's really about hypothesis testing. Science gives us scientific knowledge or knowledge from experimentation. So the role of scientists is really to test hypothetical answers to questions. They come up with questions, they revise questions, they test hypotheses, and they te do that testing in the context of a science experiment, which is planned. So these are planned investigations, and they result in data, and that data allows us to reflect back on the hypothesis and to actually form an evidence-based conclusion about it. Is it supported? Is it not supported? Is it essentially true or false? Or is there something that's inconclusive? Um, and then, again, reflect and, and continue on whether the hypo there's a new hypothesis or new question that's raised. So that scientific knowledge uh, is not just sort of knowledge for knowledge's sake, but it, it helps engineers to solve problems. So the role of engineering is really problem solving. Engineers take that scientific knowledge and they use it to prototype or to design prototypes that are potential solutions to the problems that they've identified. And so by prototyping that solution, what happens is that that prototype can be tested under sort of realistic conditions. Let's say it's a bridge trying to solve the problem of crossing a river. You would create a prototype of a, that bridge, test it under realistic conditions. If it's in an environment where it's windy, you put it in a wind tunnel, test different wind conditions, hot, cold, vibrations, all that sort of stuff. And you would gather data. And that data, as a, as a result of the testing, would allow you as an engineer to reflect back on the prototype and decide whether or not it solves the problem. Should it be refined or should it be replicated? And what data supports that claim? So that's the role of an engineer. And, and they're essentially applying that scientific knowledge. They're solving problems. And these problems that engineers solve are not only physical problems in terms of bridges or um, buildings, skyscrapers, elevators, things like this. They're also intangible problems like data management. Software applications are an example. They're medical problems. Um, drugs and sort of chemical biopharmaceuticals are all engineered um, molecules, in essence, that solve problems. So those are, of course, tangible, but, but in the case of software, not necessarily tangible. So when, a, when an engineer designs a solution and they scale it up and send it off sort of a factory to be replicated, um, that is technology. So, so the, so the engineer designs essentially the first scalable prototype or model, and then it becomes sort of technology that's part of the way we solve problems. So in education, oftentimes when we talk about technology, we think it has to be electronic. And in fact, most technology is not electronic. Uh, the rudders on ships are technology. Door stops are technology. Door knobs are technology. Um, and there are uh, tech frameworks which talk about applications of technology from the perspective of software applications. But for the purpose of the next generation science standards, technology really fits this other definition of something that solves the problem for humans or a problem for humans. So very important. This is the foundation of, of how science technology
standards, which I think is much clearer than the existing uh, Iowa or previous, I should guess, should say at this point, Iowa Core, where a lot of um, these connections are implied, and we'll take a look at, uh, at that in a second. The reason that you see math in the center is that math is really the tool for communication. Math allows scientists and engineers to measure, we would say quantify observations, but not only quantify them, but analyze them. So you think of first you collect data points, but then you analyze them by finding the mean, median, mode, and then perhaps analyze them further by finding the difference of a mean and using that data point to support a claim. So math for quantifying, for analyzing, and also for communicating because qu quantitative uh, analysis can be something that's easily understood because we have quantitative standards. Qualitative, like bluish, uh, reddish, bubbly, observations, those qual qualitative observations are things that are very hard, they're subjective, they're hard to transfer. And so uh, investigations that are based on qua qualitative observations only are, are, are very weak. So math is applied within these next generation science standards all over the place um, and, and help us to have that sort of professional discourse as students. So just looking at the existing Iowa Core format, uh, this is going to be one of the biggest changes that you'll notice um, right away, is that the formatting is very different. So this is sort of the general format in the Iowa Core. Your essential concept skill, principles underlying, and then that uh, illustration uh, matrix where you have the uh, different um, quadrants where C and D are higher rigor um, and um, B and D are essentially more, I guess, relevant, we would say. So, so we're sort of trying to aim for that quadrant D type um, instruction. And when you look at the existing Iowa core, you see a lot of language where you see, so standard here, identify and generate, and this is a grade three through five um, standard, identify and generate questions that can be answered through scientific investigations that's extremely open-ended. Um, and then as you look a little further, the expectation is students recognize that different questions lead to different types of investigations. So the language is very open-ended. Different questions, there's you know, potentially an infinite number of different questions. Different types of investigations, again, potentially infinite. And words like type, or kinds, you see those that type of wording in the Iowa core all over the place. It's very, very open-ended. And so with the next generation science standards, things get very specific, um, not in a way that constrains educators' creativity, but in a way that creates focus in terms of the minimum maximum boundaries uh, in terms of what those standards are expecting. And in fact, in the next generation science standards, they are performance expectations. So uh, it, what you see in the illustration um, boxes down here doesn't really exist in the next generation science standards. So you see something like quadrant D. Nobody is going to say that, um, pl that a performance expectation should be you know, carried out in a general sort of sense um, in quadrants like this. So in this case here, illustration of planning and conducting a scientific investigation, quadrant D, that sort of rigorous and relevant um, quadrant illustration, says students ask scientifically oriented questions, design investigations, and conduct investigations to seek answers. But you can see even in this illustration, one of the weaknesses of the Iowa core science standards is how open-ended it is. Um, so somebody looking at this would have to try to answer what is a scientifically oriented question um, in terms of designing an investigation. How do you really do that? What is acceptable for an, the design of an investigation? And when you're conducting an investigation to seek an answer, how is it that you actually formulate an answer from an investigation? So there's really, there's really not a lot of color around that. And this is an inquiry. Uh, sciences inquiry uh, strand. So if we look in the existing Iowa core at something that's more concrete like earth and space science, you still see similar sorts of 
um, wording. So understand and apply knowledge of properties and uses of earth materials. There's some examples um, here, but it's not all inclusive. Um, properties like texture, cleavage, um, density. There's a lot of different sort of angles you can take on properties, but they're not defined. Looking at the quadrant here, uh, quadrant D again, the illustration is something that may not be open to every classroom. After going to a greenhouse and talking with a nursery technician, students design an experiment to determine the impact of varying soil mixtures upon a plant of their choice. So what that experiment's design sort of in a process sense is not very well defined, but at least we have a little bit more color here in terms of greenhouse, soil, different plant types. Um, and then you still see down here where we have the last highlighted piece, the essential concept, understand and apply knowledge of weather and weather patterns. Um, there's some wording that's, again, pretty vague, described by measurable quantities. Now, some people would look at things like temperature, wind direction, speed, and precipitation, and say those are actually properties and not quantities. Um, so there's, some, there's ambiguity here is, I guess, what I'm trying to point out in the sense of when you move from the I, existing Iowa core to the next generation science standards, a lot of this ambiguity is going to disappear in terms of what is science, what is engineering, what is technology, uh, what is the role of scientific knowledge, and what is the role of math. Um, and that's where we start to get this different frame, framework or organization of, of the standards documentation itself. So this is a grade five level uh, life science standard from the next generation science standards. And the next generation science standards are performance expectations. And sort of in a legislative sense in Iowa when the uh, next generation science standards were adopted on August 6th by the um, State Board of Education, they did sort of change this wording so that it would line up that the next generation science standards would be adopted as standards. Um, and it's, it's really a nuance, but nonetheless, the next generation science standards, which you see here, 5-LS2-1, is an expectation of what students should be able to demonstrate as a result of instruction. Um, so students who demonstrate understanding can perform the expectation. So this is a performance expectation, or what would be called in Iowa now, a science standard. Grade 5 students should be able to develop a model to describe the movement of matter among plants, animals, decomposers, and the environment. So think about your classroom or classrooms in your building as a context, sort of the, within the walls of the classroom. There's a context or an inquiry environment where students are going to be able to develop and use their knowledge, and their knowledge is sort of taking three forms. And so when they're, de when they're demonstrating or practicing, it'll look like this standard. They'll be developing models, and uh, it doesn't mean that this is a task, but this should be happening as part of that task that you're maybe creating. But the environment is defined by three dimensions. So what you see below in blue, in orange, and in green are those three dimensions. The first dimension is called science and engineering practices. So practices are skills that are specific to science and engineering. Uh, they are necessary not only for using the content, but really developing it and understanding how to interact with the content in order to answer any question or solve any problem. So skills specific to the discipline, that's the first dimension in science and engineering practices. The second dimension is called the disciplinary core ideas, and these are the um, sort of content domain connections to the performance expectation here. So this is traditionally what we would think of earth science or life science that sort of um, disciplinary domain is now called the disciplinary core idea. And it's been changed and really curated in a sense so that the ideas, the disciplinary core ideas are all related almost systemically to each other so that they're building over time and they create a networked understanding. 
for students so that students aren't viewing content in isolation. The, uh, the idea that earth science is earth science and life science is life science, the new disciplinary core ideas, the second dimension, bring the two together. And then in cross-cutting concepts, which is the third dimension, that is sort of um, the patterns or behavior of the phenomena. So if we look at this, just this one performance expectation, developing a model to describe the movement of matter among plants, animals, decomposers, and the environment. Well, as a science teacher or someone who's taught um, science at an early elementary or elementary level, you probably think food chains and food webs right away because that's how matter is transferred from producers like plants to herbivores to carnivores or omnivores all the way through a food chain. And then, of course, animals eat um, multiple different things, different animals, um, different plants, different plants and animals. So you have food webs. A practice uh, that's relevant to that is developing a model to describe the phenomenon. So the idea that a student would be able to look at a scene from a field or from a forest and be able to talk about how the matter is being transferred from the plants to you know, an animal like a hawk. Um, they should be describing that in the form of something that's specific like a food chain or food web. And so the cross-cutting concept on the right side, describing this as a system of, of how the matter moves in a chain or in a food web, and describing it in terms of how those plants and animals interact and how each plant and animal is a piece in the chain or in the web. And, and all of this is in the context or disciplinary context of what you see in the center, the interdependent relationships in an ecosystem and the cycles of matter and energy transfer in ecosystems. So just reading the first sentence of each, food of almost any kind of animal can be traced back to plants. Organisms are related in food webs in which some animals eat plants for food and other animals eat the animals that eat the plants. Some organisms as a, such as fungi and bacteria break down dead organisms and so on and so forth. So what you see here is a, a content context that a student should be able to work with using their skills to develop and understand it and then be able to relate that, whether it's a picture of a field, a forest, the ocean, or so on. So this is a very different organization of standards from the, the Iowa core. It, um, standards are still something that can be grouped, uh, but the, the, the integration of inquiry is required. There's just no way around it because it's almost like a stool where the performance expectation is the top of the stool and each of these dimensions is a leg of the stool. If you take one away, it becomes unstable. And so if that inquiry environment hasn't manifested itself in this way in your classrooms um, under the current or the previous Iowa core, um, under the current next generation science standards adoption, it's really going to be necessary because that's where purpose comes from. And the new next generation science standards are really focused on authentic and purposeful um, experiences and engaging students really uh, using those STEM practices. And so when we think about STEM practices, this is what we're talking about. And we're talking about it from a student's perspective. So when you look at STEM practices here, that blue box, science and engineering practices, if you kind of gather them all up, you get these sort of eight categories that they fall under. A student needs to develop and use these practice skills. So they need able to ask questions in a scientific context, define problems in an engineering context, not only use a model, so in this case a model like food chains and food webs, but they have to be able to develop it. They have to un have an, a level of understanding where they look at something and they don't just see a plant and an animal, they actually see a food chain or a food web and can articulate it in that sense. Not only carrying out an investigation, so being given a kind of plan, hey, here's our lab that we're going to do, uh, and following that prescription. That's, that's what cookie cutter is. Giving students an investigation that they follow is when people talk about cookie cutter, that's what they're talking about. There's no opportunity for the student to create in that sense. They're just carrying out. In this case, though, these, the next generation science centers are really explicit that students have to really be able to plan 
the investigation, which means coming up with the investigation, how it will be carried out, and then carrying it out. Uh, not only being given data to interpret, but also analyze that data, taking the math uh, a bit further, not just sort of the qualitative, but the quantitative, using mathematical computational thinking. Um, this is not only in analysis, but it's something that um, manifests itself in the sense of problem solving, troubleshooting, orders of magnitude, um, understanding if the resources are available for the plan that's being planned, those sort of things uh, fall into that category. Constructing an explanation in the scientific context or designing a solution in an engineering context, uh, this is all evidence-based writing, really. It's taking that data that's gathered from the experiment or from the prototype testing and forming a, an evidence-based argument, um, which says, yeah, this is a solution, here's why, pointing to specific data or constructing an explanation saying, yes, this hypothesis was supported by the test, here's where, here's how, here's why. Um, and that's part of engaging an argument from evidence, which you see under number seven, not just saying it was validated or, or invalidated, but how, why. And so these new standards really focus on why. And of course, the whole thing relates to obtaining, evaluating, communicating information. So one way to think of these practices, the science and engineering practices, they're kind of a parallel in many ways, um, this wording around practices and processes to the way that we approach English language in our classrooms, especially if you're an elementary or early elementary teacher or somebody who's teaching in a self-contained classroom. Science and engineering practices form the scientific process that we use to answer questions scientifically through the use of hypothesis uh, making testing and designing experiments, and also the engineering design process, the process that we go about for problem solving and designing prototypes and testing them and forming conclusions. In an ELA context, we talk about writing practices in the writing process. The writing practices are things like word choice, sentence structure, um, tone. The writing process brings those practices together in different combinations at different times as students brainstorm, they pre-write, they peer review, they draft, they publish. Um, those sort of stages where the practices come together are the process of writing. In the case of science and engineering, there's a scientific process and an engineering process. So these practices are really skills specific to inquiry in a scientific and engineering context, but in order to carry out the science and the engineering, they need to be applied in a process that's relevant, uh, whether it's science or engineering. Under the sort of traditional model of science instruction, and under the current Iowa standards, this is not supposed to be, or the <laughs> current is, is, I guess, a, a relative uh, word here. So the under the Iowa core that um, was just retired, the traditional model of STEM instruction really wasn't acceptable because those inquiry standards, even under the previous version, should have been infused throughout earth science, life science, and so on. But that doesn't mean it always happens. Uh, in a textbook environment, um, what you tend to see is a traditional model of science instruction where there's a large body of content which you see sort of up the top, and that content and you know, if you have a science teacher, oftentimes that teacher sees themselves as the science expert, and so the teacher then relays that content to the students sort of alongside a text. So you read about, and again, reading about science or reading about engineering, um, and then distributing that knowledge through modeling the facts or maybe demonstrations of the phenomena. Isn't this cool? Look at what happens when these things come together. And really, as the person who's explaining what's happening. Now, if that's the teacher's role in this traditional model, what is the student's role? The student's role in the traditional model is often just recall focused. So recalling facts, um, thinking about, you know, OK, this was the fact that was given to me, whether it was to the teacher or the textbook. And when I demonstrate that fact back as a student, 
I'm proficient. If I can repeat the demonstration, I'm proficient. Or if I can summarize the phenomenon, I'm proficient. So that's a real traditional model, really discipline-focused model of STEM instruction. So STEM being science, technology, engineering, and math. A next-gen model is really very different. Um, it's really looking at the teacher as somebody who's tuning that inquiry environment. And this hopefully has already been happening under the previous Iowa standards in your classrooms where the, the students are developing and using those practice skills, skills specific to science and engineering, which we just looked at a moment ago, those sort of eight areas. And the, and the teacher's gradually adjusting supports. Okay, and think about that as the level of release of responsibility or um, the level of detail in the conclusions. So, so teachers tuning that environment, they're helping the students to engage appropriately so the student really understands what the expectations are of the practices and also the processes and helps redirect and monitor. So that's why you see the teacher sort of having a connection to the student and the skills but also the content and the cross-cutting concepts because they're helping to sort of um, tune and monitor and kind of manage and in that sense. From a student standpoint, they are when they demonstrate expectations under the next generation science standards, they're actually developing and using content. Um, and that's sort of within this context of the the inquiry environment that's been created. So that may be an environment that's looking at the things like life science and um, food chains and food webs. So the interaction between, you know, parts of a animal's body and different types of plants and doing an investigation around how form and function are in, are, are closely uh, tied. So the student would be carrying that out, testing their ideas. They'd be using the skills to really solve the problem or answer the question uh, as a scientist or engineer. And then being able to, dis to describe what the phenomenon or content they're interacting with um, in terms of its dynamic interaction, so those cross-cutting concepts, really um, using the system behavior to understand what they're seeing and also communicate it. So it's very, very different. It's much more authentic. It's much more specific um, than what would have potentially been allowable under the previous Iowa standards where, you know, to develop a plan or to um, describe something was really open-ended. Um, so what does it look like in a classroom? It looks like this. So probably not a lot different than what you have um, seen in classrooms that are, were engaged with inquiry under the previous standards. In this case, students have gone through nonfiction reading, there's been Socratic dialogue, and they're engaged as engineers. They've come to a, a, a point as a class where they're going to solve a problem. They've articulated a problem, they're going to solve it. Now they've broken into teams and they are acting, these two students are acting as a team to go through, take the problem apart, pull facts from what they've discussed, what they've read about, consider potential solutions, look at the available materials, and really diagram and then build a specific solution that they believe as two lab partners here uh, will solve that problem. And then they're going to test it. So it's not enough to just design something or build it, but they're going to test it. So they're going to gather quantitative data using their math skills and their math practice skills from Common Core math to, um, to reflect, to gather data, but then analyze, evaluate what they've created and reflect back on it as to whether or not it should be refined um, or scaled up, replicated. So that's what it looks like. Um, when you think about the skills, those creative, evaluative, analytical skills, there's something that cross over every area and there's something that is really required by these next generation science standards. So while it's required in this you know, next generation inquiry context with students as scientists and engineers, the skills are useful for ELA and they're useful for math because there's crossover. And I'll show you just from the Common Core ELA and the Common Core math uh, standards where there's crossover, but as a part of any Non, as part of any next generation context, you need background. And so there's going to be nonfiction reading. There's also going to be Socratic dialogue, hopefully, um, where students are 
bringing their ideas forward as a group and there's an educator that's facilitating that discussion. Uh, so it's collaborative. The other piece is that as a student's generating a plan, that's a nonfiction text. And so they are actually developing a nonfiction text as part of planning their science or engineering investigation. So that's nonfiction writing. Uh, it's process writing as well. Within a math context, you have data collection, graphing, you have information being rendered visually, and we'll take a look at that. And we see all the applications of Common Core math practice skills. So we'll take a look at that in a second, too. The only things that are truly, like purely only science time on learning is the experimenting and prototyping itself. Everything else, and maybe we would say the Socratic dialogue, everything else really is attributed to ELA and math. So this next generation science standards articulation is, I think, very helpful to educators in terms of being able to create something that's authentic, something that's inquiry-based, something that is integrated across the curriculum, and something that's very, very purposeful, not only from a student's point of view in terms of releasing that responsibility, giving them sort of um, the opportunity to develop a mission or develop from a mission uh, something that they are thinking about, but, uh, but it's also tying into all these other content areas that makes them even more personal and more relevant. So the next generation science standards are making a big shift, especially in this area of the practices and processes, in higher order thinking. So Bloom's taxonomy traditionally is remembering so lowest level to highest level, it's sort of six-tiered pyramid. Lowest is remembering, then understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and the highest being creating. Under the next generation science standards, the inquiry environment really reorganizes this in a sense where creating, evaluating, and analyzing those higher order thinking skills happens simultaneously as students are in the role of scientist and engineer. When they plan their investigation, they're creating. When they are having a Socratic dialogue or looking at the evidence that they've gathered and forming a database conclusion, they are evaluating and analyzing. These lower level skills like remembering, understanding, and applying are still necessary, but they're insufficient um, for mastery. So think about you know, ex what you've been executing under the previous Iowa standards. Um, it, hopefully the inquiry environment is something that's an everyday environment in the classroom. Hopefully it's structured. Hopefully these practices and processes are already in place. And then you should have that creating, evaluating, and analyzing happening simultaneously. If it's not, then there needs to be a shift from a lower level focus to an upper level focus. And um, if you've been relying sort of on textbooks, um, that's going to be difficult because that gives us things to remember and understand, um, maybe some analyze and evaluate, but in this case, from a personal standpoint, developing and using the phenomenon, um, students are going to have to do that sort of firsthand in some, in some fashion. Just connecting over to the Common Core ELA and math standards. So these I pulled from middle school just to point out uh, that uh, evidence to support, support analysis is a uh, ELA technical subject standard. Uh, summarizing text distinct from prior knowledge, again, is a ELA common core standard. Following precisely a multi-step procedure is not science. It's a ELA common core standard. So in classrooms where you've seen students be given a multi-step procedure or a, a chart of pictures, sort of a build by number, I mean, the famous one is Legos. You, every student you know, loves Legos, and they get a picture of what to build, and they build by number. Um, that's following a multi-step procedure. Not science. It's actually ELA. Integrating quantitative and technical information expressed in words in a text with a version that is expressed visually, that's ELA. So again, as part of this plan, you're gathering data, you're putting it in a table, you might be doing a graph or a diagram, but then you're also going to be summarizing it in a conclusion 
um, in text form. So again, important for science, but it, it, shoes on the other foot here a little bit. It's actually helping accomplish an ELA technical subject standard. And of course, distinguishing facts, reason, judgment based on research findings or speculation. During the debrief, when students pay, they come back together, all these different pairs of students have been working on a problem or a question that they approached completely differently. They had different solutions, they had different hypotheses, and they potentially had different results. So when they share their conclusions, there's going to be all this variation that they need to understand. They need to look at what they've created, look at what their peers have created, and really understand whether that's speculation, whether it's fact, is, is the difference em emanating from human error. These are uh, important science and engineering practice skills, but they're also achieving these goals of uh, Common Core ELA. And then on the math side, we have math practices, right? Our Common Core math practices, making sense of problems, reasoning abstractly, persevere in solving the problems, constructing viable arguments, which are again data-based, modeling with math, using appropriate tools. Now a tool is not just a hammer or a saw or an equation. A tool is a process, a practice. Um, attending to precision, so again that, that specific language, making use of structure, that's a process, that's a, that is a procedure, um, expressing regularity and repeated reasoning. One of the activities that brings this out, a lot of times people will, in an ELA context, when they do process writing, will assign how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and students come back with a 200 step procedure. That's because the students did not express regularity and repeated reasoning. They don't use recursive steps. They haven't been trained to do that. Uh, and they're also not attending to precision or making use of structure. So in a science context or an engineering context, we're making use of these math practices, which I just said ELA process writing. Well, when we think of process writing, that's ELA, right? So we, we're already talking across the curriculum, even though that this is related to how students plan investigations in sort of a next generation inquiry environment. So think, uh, think about that as, um, as you consider these new standards. An important lesson that we can uh, learn from the Common Core before we talk about effective STEM instruction is that really these next generation science standards are standards. They are not curriculum. In the, the previous uh, Iowa standards were not curriculum. They were standards. And then when you look at um, different districts definition of curriculum, oftentimes what that comes down to is just taking the standards and saying first trimester, second trimester, third trimester, these are the standards and vocabulary words that you want to focus on. That's not enough. Um, that is not curriculum for effective STEM instruction. That's just parsing standards and parsing vocabulary. Um, it actually goes much deeper than that. And we're not today. We're not going to be able to get into that level of depth. I'll share a link with you at the end if you want to take a look. Um, you're welcome to see the level of depth that it takes um, because we have uh, some next generation units you can look at and see from both sides, from a student side and from a teacher side, how those two come together and are supported in curriculum. But for the next generation science standards to be effective and to be something that is good for students and teachers and and something that leads to positive performance improvements for the district, we really need to think about how those standards are interpreted. And that's what happened with Common Core ELA and Common Core Math where the standard, the interpretation of the standards was in many cases poor interpretations. And so you see states like New York that become sort of famous for parents coming to meetings and holding up, you know, assignments or assessments with crazy questions. And a lot of them are crazy that sort of hit the media. But the reality is, is that it's not the standard itself that was crazy. It was the interpretation that was crazy. Because the, the standard is not curriculum and it's not an activity. Uh, curriculum's job is really to help define or really, def you know, as th there's a level, you know, you need cr educator creativity and flexibility, but it creates a min and max, sort of a boundary, a, a scope and sequence and a definition of what that inquiry environment is. And it articulates concepts and vocabulary in such a way that 
that it, there is scaffolding, and so the, that standards are being grouped and effective STEM instruction is taking place. And so we have to ask the question now, what is effective STEM instruction? And we have a definition from the National Research Council that goes all the way back to 2011, which really, again, it was is infused in these next generation science standards along with that idea of sort of a STEM cycle or the definition of science and engineering. So let's take a look at it. Effective STEM instruction capitalizes on students' early interests and experiences. It identifies and builds on what they know, and it provides them with experiences to engage them in the practices of science and sustain their interest. So this is all very, very specific wording. So just to unpack it here for a second, effective STEM instruction capitalizes on students' early interests and experiences. So this isn't something that's just happening in third grade uh, when testing starts, for instance. Uh, this is something that's really looking at the student holistically from pre-K all the way through grade 12 and beyond, that there's an intentional early effort to engage the student's interest in their experiences. And then to scaffold by identifying and building on what they know, and again, intentionally so that it's nurturing the student from that pre-K to first grade on up and then providing the students as part of that environment with the experiences to engage them in the practices. And those practices, again, are the science and engineering practices that we had just looked at. So these are the practices. The students are being engaged in using and developing um, the content with these practices and moving at a pace and a scope and sequence that sustains their interest. And so again, putting them in that role, getting them engaged in those practices, um, is sustaining their interest. So not making units that are three or four or five month units where you know nobody wants to hear about a rock or mineral anymore because they've had a play about it and done a poem about it and done an experiment and it just sort of grows legs and walks all on its own. So what does it look like in the classroom? Again that left to right. On the left side you see you know a more traditional model where it's teacher centered. Something's being modeled or demonstrated and then the students kind of go off and carry out what they just saw again on their own to something that you see on, sorry, on the left. On the right, that shift towards the right where you see students who are engaged in the practices, bringing their ideas forward, intentionally nurtured uh, and with scaffolding throughout the year and then from year to year so that the skills go deeper, the content goes deeper in a very intentional and kind of nurturing way. So. I want to show you what that looks like in the classroom from different environments. So again, students have, you, you can see here in front of them, a plan. Those different teams have created different plans. It's authentic because they've created it. They're applying their skills and then carrying out their plan, testing. And what's interesting is, is it's not just suburban, urban, and rural environments that benefit from these kinds of engagements but it's every student uh, because they're being equipped or really empowered to access content through skills that they're developing and that's really important and what this picture I like to throw out there because uh, some of our uh, material is used in refugee camps actually in the Kurdish region of northern Iraq so children whose families have fled uh, violent conflict um, related to ISIS and you see the same type of grouping and behavior, and this is all taking place in Arabic, um, despite the conditions, despite not having gas and hoods and water tables and all these sort of things, that the practice skills and the content can still come together at early elementary, elementary, even middle school level. And then you can see here again the student teams working in pairs. Once students have carried out their investigation, they are having to bring that together, analyze that data. So they're bringing the data together, they're analyzing it, and then once they've analyzed their evidence, they're forming that conclusion and carrying out uh, sort of a peer discourse where there's a teacher that's facilitating the discussion and encouraging different teams to share, and then teams are listening, giving feedback to each other very important. So as you think about the sort of where you are in implementation right now, so 
Iowa, there's a plan forthcoming for implementation. That implementation timeline has not been published yet by the Iowa Board of Education, but generally states have taken a th about a three-year to four-year implementation timeline. The way that works um, in most cases, that teams are convened, sort of curriculum teams, to try and look at what they have for resources, what the standards are requiring, and try and understand if they can achieve alignment, and if not, how are they going to get aligned uh, for all their grade levels. As you look out there, there are resources that are aligned. There's not very many of them. Um, and most of the ones that claim to be aligned really aren't. They are engaging students in the practices, but not the processes, and they're not entirely authentic. Um, and so that is a challenge. Uh, the equip rubric is a great tool to use to kind of judge alignment of resources. Uh, but what we see is that there's different there's resources that are available for different readiness levels. And to just try to break that out for you quickly here, looking at the different readiness levels, there's awareness readiness, which are, is sort of the trip to the museum, or the field trip um, kind of museum resource approach, where as a result of engaging in something, students become aware that it exists. And that may be having an expert scientist or engineer come to the classroom and say, hey, I'm, an, I'm a scientist. Here's how I use science. As a result of that engagement, students are aware, they're probably excited, but they're not necessarily ready to go out and build circuits. Uh, they don't really understand the basics of how electrons flow and direct current versus alternating or work versus power source and all of these sort of things. They're just aware. The next level is knowledge readiness, and this is something that we commonly see with textbooks. Textbooks are great at delivering knowledge about what scientists and engineers have done sort of historically, backward looking. Um, so if you want to know all about science or engineering, read a book. Performance readiness is something that we think of like kits. Um, FOSS kits, STC kits are common, um, kind of going all the way back to the 60s and 70s. These kits, you know, by and large, are pretty similar in a lot of ways. Uh, materials with some activities that you choose from, and the activities are pointed at something specific like, if you want to find out how hard a rock is, you can do a scratch test. Or if you want to find out how hard a mineral is, you do a scratch test. And here's how a scratch test is done. And so when a student is asked that question, they are able to perform that task, gather that data. So they can perform it. They're ready to perform it. And they can, of course, you know, connect this to knowledge and awareness. Mastery readiness is really about the skills to be able to solve any problem or any question that is context agnostic in a lot of ways. So in the case of next generation science standards, we have sort of con boundaries of context, which is great. Uh, but again, the context is not, it's specific, but it's not so specific that in the sense of when the student may be given the picture of a forest, um, that it may be a temperate forest, um, or it may be you know, something that's more, um, you know, a completely different climate even, forget about forests. It might be tundra and looking at, you know, plants and animals there and be, being expected to perform the expectation that they will be able to uh, develop a model that communicates how matter transfers through that food chain or food web um, from one plant to an animal to different animals. Um, so in a mastery context, or in one other example I'll give you here is performance readiness Think of the example of how hard is a you know, specific rock or mineral. In a mastery context, if we are building a kitchen, how, you know, we, need, we need durable countertops. And these are the, the materials we have to choose from. Can you make a recommendation? What test would you do? And this is, again, you as a student. What test would you do to figure out which material is best for the countertops. And so a student would have to say, well, what's durability, first of all? Second of all, how can I gather that data? So I need a, a plan, procedure. OK, carry that out. Here's the data. What does that data say about each material? And then I can form a conclusion. That's mastery readiness. And there's not many resources for that. Um, of course, we develop resources like this. Um, you're welcome to take a look on our website. We have samples that um, you can download 
under, you look up the top bar, it says STEM curriculum. So the curriculum is really that understanding by design model, grade specific, and again, specific September through June, grouping the standards. Um, we have professional development that helps educators sort of map their existing skill set over to their new um, sort of expectations under these standards. And then, of course, the materials to carry out any curriculum needs materials to carry out the investigations. Experiences under the Next Generation Science Standards are not experiences that lend themselves to simulations um, or electronic, sort of the tr tr typical electronic resource. And here's why. Because a student needs to be able to use and develop the content uh, and experience something that's authentic and purposeful. And a lot of electronic resources, as they currently exist, do not allow for the manipulation, it's sort of open-ended um, interaction and manipulation of variables. So if you think about the countertop example, somehow, uh, if you're going to do that in a, an electronic simulation, the student needs to be able to design an authentic procedure you know, apply that, gather data, and then reflect back on the data. So the authenticity in creating a procedure and then gathering data um, runs into issues there. So if you do hands-on uh, instruction, inquiry instruction, then great, you know, you're probably set up um, with a lot of materials already. Um, if not, you're going to have to think about how you blend or what other resources you use that are going to allow students to really engage that experience. And so things like curriculum materials and professional development have to be cohesive. They have to connect together in an intentional way to allow for that STEM learning environment. And now I'm going to click over real quick and grab some questions. I just want to show you some data um, real quick. What does it look like when you apply this in an inquiry environment? So a place like New Hampshire, Maine, um, Vermont, Rhode Island, um, use an assessment system like the NECAP, New England Common Assessment Program, and you can see in purple, dark purple, and in yellow how um, the school performed re relative to the state in physical earth life science and inquiry. And again, um, that's just under very similar standards to what standards model to what Iowa has traditionally functioned under. <coughs> and you can see there are areas where they're performing upwards of um, 30 percent higher than the state average. And then in other areas when you look at um, places like Massachusetts that look more at the facts than the inquiry piece, you can see in an urban environment, again, um, even in open response sections, well above state average where 70 uh, percent high needs, low income environments in fairly big cities are going from 36 prof proficient and advanced combined to 87 percent proficient and advanced. And then again, in suburban environments, you still see double-digit gains and those gains sustained over time. So I do want to save some time for questions. I'm happy to bounce back and around as questions come up. If you take a look on the right side of your screen, there is a spot where you're welcome to input questions. I'll try to get to as many as I can. and um, I'll do my best not to be redundant if there are similar questions. If I'm unable to get to your question, feel free to uh, reach back. You can shoot an email to me, uh, Francis Vigent, right there at the top. You have my email address. Or you can uh, reach out to Mary Ellen, who uh, you may have already been in contact with. Uh, shoot her an email. You can call her directly, 617-475. 3475. Uh, while these questions are coming in, uh, I'll let you know that there's an on-demand uh, tour that you can take through a Next Generation Science Unit uh, as we've developed them. Uh, you can access that by going to info.noadam.com slash a-guided-tour-of, there's dashes between all these words, <laughs> the Next Generation science unit. There's no www dot in front of that either. And then again, if you want to take a look at a sample unit, um, there's samples for first grade through eighth grade at noadam.com forward slash stem dash curriculum. Okay, so I have some questions. 
going to grab those. Okay, there's a question in here about what other uh, resources are available. So when we follow up with you, um, and there's another one in here as well, are these slides going to be available? The, when we follow up with you after the webinar, um, we're just going to shoot an email over. In that, there will be a link to a recording of this webinar. So you won't get the full slide deck in the sense of a PowerPoint, but what you will get is a uh, link to the recording. And so if you want to mute me, that's fine. And you'll have access to the slides there. The other piece is uh, in terms of resources, um, we will send you over a, a link to the Equip rubric, which was developed by the folks at Achieve and National, uh, National Science Teachers Association and others that really, it, you know, takes a look at, hey, what is alignment, what is assessment, what is um, sort of appropriate for these new next generation science standards and, you know, what do you think about in that context. Um, other resources that we will follow up with is, again, we'll send you this link that's up top. If you want to take a look at sample units, there's also uh, sample nonfiction reading material in there. And then we also have, if you haven't uh, participated, we had a webinar recently uh, looking at strategically implementing the next generation science standards. And you'd be welcome to take part in that. All of these resources are free resources. Um, so we, you know, would welcome you to engage in those as you see fit. Other questions? Okay, there's a question about teaching all students with the next generation science standards. Um, and it looks like maybe some skepticism if, <laughs> if these standards can be uh, standards for all students. And the answer to that is, quite frankly, they are standards for all students. The question is, I think at its root, how do we engage all students as scientists or engineers? How do we make an inquiry context that releases responsibility to students fully, but yet for students who may be on um, IEPs or have um, different accommodations, you know, how do we do that? And also for English language learners. So the way that you go about that really is to think about what's the primary barrier? So if a student has a language-based learning disability and you're having students plan their investigations, as you saw in the picture, with composition notebooks, then it's a reasonable accommodation for that student to perhaps um, have a scribe. Or um, if, they don't, if, they're, if they don't have that level of um, a language-based learning disability, to you know, potentially allow them to uh, use a computer or a tablet and do their plan there and make the accommodation that maybe they can sketch their scientific diagram by hand and, you know, just keep those separately or using a, a kind of paint program to sketch it. And so, you know, maybe there's two files that you have. Little accommodations like that that, uh, you know, again, the standard does not require that a student does something in a blank composition notebook that's pen and paper. Um, so we have to think creatively about that. On the other side, um, this is group work, um, that any learning in a group environment tends to be more robust in terms of 21st century skills and what happens in sort of a, just individually um, on one's own. So when you think about that, um, think about how you're doing those pairings of students. Pairing students appropriately also um, is a great tool for helping students achieve mastery and not be limited by, you know, a language-based learning disability. The other thing, though, is that having multiple modalities. So, so the the purpose of nonfiction reading 
or the text is really to give everybody a common background. It's something that's text-based, but it's also something that could be done on a Kurzweil reader. It's something that can be read aloud, um, especially at those earlier grade levels where students are still getting proficiency with their reading and ELA skills. Uh, Language-based um, learning disabilities is one thing. English language learners is a, is a whole other sort of thing. So if a student is an English language learner, and let's say they're in a substantially separate classroom, What's great about this is that you are able to make things, you're, you're able to pull it out of the text. And so students are able to investigate with their ideas hands-on. And we know English language learners are verbal first. And so you're making something that's, you know, you're making something auditory, you're making it verbal, and you're making it also kinesthetic. And so there's many modalities for a student to engage uh, with these standards uh, in all these different contexts. Now, this is where my warning about lessons from Common Core, ELA, and math come to light. If the interpretation of the Next Generation Science Standards is that we're going to read a text and we're going to have little boxes, one box that says cross-cutting concept and another little box that says disciplinary core idea and another little box that says performance expectation and there's some sort of culminating activity that's you know a make by number or procedure that's given to students then that's backwards because what's happened there is everything's being rooted in the text in the follow by number it's not really authentic and um, and you know you're going to have trouble um, if if you need, you know if you can make things uh, suitable for all learners and the materials don't allow for that then then that's a problem so both really great questions or three or four questions around that um, we have gone a little bit over here uh, the last question and if you have any others there's one in here about grants if you have any others feel free to reach back uh, drop an email or uh, give a call. Grants, we don't have grants, unfortunately. Um, if you do have a local organization like a large company that gives grants on a regular basis, if you have a PTO, if you have a budget um, for seeding or however that works, we have a grants page that talks about how to go about writing a grant, things to think about, best practices. Um, and some things to sort of maybe look for in the types of grants that you might apply for to be able to test uh, materials or pilot. We do have some pilots for elementary and middle school available uh, this year. The person to contact about that is Mary Ellen. But what you basically want to think about is, first of all, how is whatever grant you're creating uh, going to basically allow you to test or seed something in your community that if it works well, your community is going to be able to you know, bring in as its own and take over over time and that there's some thought and planning around that um, kind of process. And so we lay that out in that grant section, something to look at. But uh, again, back to that implementation timeline, until we see from the, the Board of Education what the literal dates are and then of course how the Iowa assessments will iterate to um, a con you know, basically test these next generation science standards. Um, the thing to be thinking about is, you know, what resources are available, and then piloting or testing, and looking at them uh, with your curriculum teams. Because now this is a, a major shift. I think there's a lot of great pieces um, that, and probably professional development that's gone on in your district around the previous Iowa standards, which involved inquiry. But now it's going to become more authentic, it's going to become more specific, and we're going to have to release more responsibility to students. And that's uh, going to be important that everyone's on the same page with that message. And then um, life will be much easier from there. Well, thank you so much for your time. I won't keep you any longer. Um, I hope you'll look for the follow-up email. And we look forward to um, talking with you further if there's any questions and if you would like to uh, take a closer look at any other webinars or resources please feel free to reach out visit noadam.com thank you bye bye